Good morning, everyone. Welcome. All right. Journals, page 117. Do you have a clicker for me? Thanks. If you emailed me the last two days for the alternate assignment for the eco meal, I haven't done emails the last two days, so I will get back to you today about that. If you emailed me last week and haven't heard from me, that's weird, because I think I was all caught up as of Friday. I sent out a bunch of them. So if you, ha if you emailed me last week and haven't heard from me, just drop me another email, please. And I'm sorry if that is too much. Uh, the other possibility is that you sent it to the wrong Jen Anderson. There are two of us in the Penn State system, so my email is jab56, um, so make sure you're emailing the right Jen Anderson. All right, let's just take a moment and take a deep breath. Come into this space and be fully present here. Thanks. Thanks for coming. A um, couple of reminders. Tonight is the final extra credit movie. 7 o'clock in 106 Osmond. You'll meet Izzy there, and she'll be there to show you the movie and then um, have a conversation about it. And then to get full credit, you will write the reflection in the back of your journal and give that to your TA. You can continue to sign up for TA Conversations. I have that clipboard up here up front. So having a beautiful representation of all of you as TAs is wonderful. Having different majors, different opinions, different views, different experiences in life is really valuable. Helps to bring this community together. Celebrating the diversity. So today where we are is continuing this exploration of these major parts of our ecological footprint. So we talked last week about food and about shelter, and then the last piece, the last big one-third of our ecological footprint is transportation. How do we get from place to place? What do we do with the cultural cultural story of where we are and what we're doing. So as we take these long deep breaths in and out, I want you to, maybe even if it helps, you can put your hands on your rib cage and feel how your ribs change and move as you, as you breathe, right? The flexibility of our bodies to change. That space in our ribs expands and contracts, and the flexibility is vital, right? That flexibility helps us to survive. So I want you to start this morning by reflecting on how flexible are you? And I don't mean in just your body, you know? I mean like in life, as, as life throws you curveballs or as something unexpected comes up, or as you know, new opportunities face your, your being, how flexible are you? Take a moment to reflect, and then you can talk to your neighbor about that. How flexible are you when it comes to change?
So this is a good thing to know about yourself. It's something that, fle that flexibility and change and when things change in my world, it's something that I really struggle with. Even on Saturday, I had a plan for what Saturday would look like with my kids, the things we were gonna do and work on and be in the house and sort of just celebrate the change of weather. And, and instead, they had the idea that we were gonna go mountain biking and we were going to eat, go out to eat and we were going to, they had all these things that we were gonna do and it took me a long time to just shift my plan. Like I had things in mind, there's shit that needs to get done. And nope, nope, what we're gonna do is get our bikes out, we're gonna get them on the car, we're gonna go. And, and I was pretty grumpy about it. Um, and then until I was able to fall into a routine of what happened. And then the flip side of the story was we got to the spot where they wanted to bike and it was too wet, it was too muddy, it was frustrating. It, and then their ideas of being flexible to change, being disappointed, being angry. And I, okay, so we just gotta flow through this, right? So taking turns, being tense, um, led for a really interesting day of self-reflection for me. Uh, so what happens in those moments? Like as we're talking about these ways of changing our habits in order to be more mindful for ourselves or for the other people around us or for the planet, what kind of flexibility are you feeling? You know, what, what we're trying to get to is this place of where we could lower our ecological footprint and also work less, potentially have more fun, be more free and creative and become more fully human. So how can we do those things? But it, it requires that flexibility of being, right? Trying out things, finding things that don't work, finding things that do work. It's a matter of all kinds of, of change and being flexible to that. As always, there's only 50 minutes you know, in these class periods. And so I can't present all of the angles and all of the topics and all of the options um, but what I'm hoping is that these conversations with me or with, with your neighbors spark thoughts for you, spark your own kind of inspiration where you want to go out and explore and do other things and find out for yourself. So this is just the beginning, right? And so then the flexibility is there. Uh, I want to say that there's an additional resource page coming to Canvas very soon. Autumn has put together a really awesome list of Penn State organizations that you can be involved in related to things that spark your interest. So I'll let you know for sure when that's up uh, because I think that there's a lot of really cool resources there um, that you might be interested in. So today, transportation. I want you to start in this place. Take a moment and brainstorm on your paper. Cars are great for what? Cars are great. You can talk to your neighbor once you get a list of your own going. So what are cars good for? So what do you have? What are cars good for? Microphones are out.
I wrote cars are great for traveling, transportation, and luxury. I think there's a difference between traveling and transportation, though they are synonyms. Because when I think of traveling, I think of greater distances, more vacation retreats. Um, I think of it as not something that's necessary. It's something that we choose to do, some uh, like a place we want to go, an adventure, kind of. And obviously, um, it'd be much more difficult to travel to places without uh, this type of transportation, w without these types of like uh, vehicles or planes even. Um, transportation is more like, um, you know, going to the store, going to uh, school, your friend's house, going to work. It's more of a uh, commute, um, something that you don't want to do that you have to do. Uh, so, and the car is more like a tool that helps convenience that. And then luxury, the last thing. I think we for some people um, remember this, other people don't. Some people might think that cars are more like a tool than anything. But sometimes I look at it as this uh, luxury, not a toy, but certainly something that you know I can appreciate and love and be thankful for having. Because there was there was one day in particular earlier this semester just swamped with work. And I took a weekend where I drove down to Huntington and I just blasting music. And it was honestly one of the most therapeutic and best days of the semester, I'd argue. Nice. Yeah, I, I think you covered a lot there. I really appreciate, thank you, your, your difference between traveling and transportation. I think that that's great. Uh, an interesting thing to think about. Anything else? Any other thoughts about what are cars good for? I think cars are great for protection. So if we're going, like, let's say to the supermarket and it's snowing or something, we could risk, or like a blizzard or rain, mm. we could risk mm -hmm. frostbite or something. But now with new technology, we could protect ourselves from that. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna break this down a little bit today. It's 93% um, of households in the United States have cars. 77% um, of people in a recent survey said that cars were necessary. Um, and 22% said no, owning a car is not necessary. It's interesting that 93% of households have them, 77% of people said that they're absolutely necessary. And for thousands of years, we lived without them, and now we must have them. So how we've set up our communities, how we have set up our culture requires, like he said, those, those commutes you know, to the grocery store, keeping us safe, and also for convenience of those, those trips to the store. Um, like, I don't have a grocery store near to my house, and so if I were to find, you know, ride my bike to the grocery store, it's going to be seven miles away, which then isn't very convenient for bringing home groceries for the four of us that live in my household. So having my car, somebody recently asked me, what is the thing that you appreciate most, like item that you appreciate most in your life? And my answer was my car. Um, I really do, for that convenience sake, um, appreciate it. So can you even imagine life without cars, right? We've set up, we looked at this the other day when we talked about shelter. We set it up where I, there is not a grocery store close to my house. And so how to make our communities so that we have these, these things more accessible to us. Um, so what is it that we really need, right, is, is always an important question. So. One gallon of gas um, yields 20 pounds of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It seems impossible that a gallon of gasoline that weighs 6.3 pounds, so as I filled up my gas tank yesterday, I put in eight gallons of gas, right? Each of which of those gallons weighs six pounds, so it's like 48 or so pounds of gas that I put into my car. But then when it combusts in our average, you know, the usual combust, com, combust, excuse me, combustible engines that we have today, 
Um, it's, it's combining with the oxygen in the air, and that's when those carbon and hydrogen molecules separate, which is what gives the energy for your car to go. The hydrogen combines with oxygen to form water, and that's why you see the condensation coming out of the back of your car. Um, oxygen is a heavier element, and so then when it forms or when it combines with the carbon, that's when it gets really heavy, right? And that's where the, the weight gain happens when these pounds of carbon dioxide are going into our atmosphere. Um, so it's important to understand this so that we can see that then the greenhouse gas emissions, um, a lot of it is carbon dioxide, that's that CO2 that's being formed when your car is driving, um, and 27% of the greenhouse gases are coming from, uh, from cars, from transportation. Um, that includes trucks, things that are transporting goods and, and things to our places. Uh, and then it's interesting to break down the other things that, that are putting that greenhouse gas out there, the electric power, you know, creating electric power, and then industry, commercial and residential, and then agriculture. So we've touched on a lot of those different ones in how we've broken down our environmental challenges that we're facing right now. The other thing to think about is that the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector, so sort of the same sort of graph, um, transportation, commercial, this is another way of looking at that, how many millions of metric tons of carbon dioxide are being put into the atmosphere. Um, Autumn found an interesting article that stated that the U.S. Department of Defense is the largest single emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. The U.S. military and its manufacturers, fuel for jets and ships and tanks, electricity for the bases that we maintain around the world, the weapons manufacturing and its supply chains. Um, and this information is really just coming to light and is not even included on this kind of graph, whereas it is one of the largest um, the largest users or creators of these, of these greenhouse gases. So, interesting to note just how the story can be shaped from one place to another. So, what are the challenges that we see with cars? What are the downsides of what cars bring to us, right? The fuel cost, when we do the fuel cost the full cost accounting for fuel. Um, when we're thinking about the oil and gas industry, as we think about all of the property development or property acquisition, and then the exploration and development costs, and all of that put into one big pool and pot of money, it costs way more than we pay for a, a, a gallon of gas at the store. So we aren't paying what gas actually costs the planet, right? If we were going to do that, it would be closer to like $15 a gallon. And so when we consider these things about cars, what do we think about the, the other costs of cars, right? What are some other downsides to cars? Can anybody think of anything else? One thing that I've seen is like the amount of space cars take up. I saw a picture and it was I believe like New York City and it was if you subtract all of the roads from New York City, like how barren it looks. Uh, so it's like the amount that we invest in like our space and our communities, um, like from a square footage basis is really a big cost of vehicles. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, thinking about the space, thank you. Yeah. I think one of the well, two different things. One, the environmental cost because of how inefficient gas combustion engines are. But then also the social cost because of how much of a social status symbol cars can be. And therefore, it kind of forces you to live a life of luxury to kind of fully represent that uh, 
that overall cost, and that's another big thing that isn't a factor that most people think of. Mm, interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. What else? So another way um, is definitely through a safety concern for not only people driving, but also people on the street. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's a big one, right? Especially for your age group of people. Um, there's a lot of danger in this. Car accidents are the leading cause of death for drivers ages 15 to 20. As a category of accidents, motor vehicle fatality is the leading cause of death to teenagers, representing 20% of those deaths. More than 38,000 people die every year due to car accidents. Um, and then the, the, the increase of that now um, with distracted driving, and distracted driving meaning phones, but then also, I mean, I think about even like the number of times I'm eating in the car and just how that causes a distraction. And so how can we be more mindful, right, and be therefore much safer according to this? Um, and I wanna go back to what you were saying a little bit in a different angle about the social connection. Um, I'd like you to check out this short video about uh, the impact of cars. Louisville Streets provided the first evidence-based research of the problem of traffic on neighborhood streets. It provided the foundational arguments for traffic calming. Donald Appleyard, who was a professor, conducted a series of studies on three different streets in San Francisco, chosen to be as identical as possible in every dimension except for one, the amount of traffic on each street. And what Donald Appleyard was able to show that just the mere presence of cars with the envelope of danger that they project around them and the noise and the pollution crushes the quality of life in our neighborhoods. What's really interesting about the graphics in Louisville Streets and what they really provided was it removed us from just looking at specific numbers of people being hit or killed on streets, but actually showing that there was this other way that we could measure the environmental impacts of traffic on neighborhood streets. Things such as a light traffic street helped knit a community together, and in contrast, a heavily trafficked street would actually rip it apart, and fewer social ties were able to be created. This chart here shows the social interaction on these three different streets. So each line shows a connection between one person on the street and another. There are just a lot fewer lines on the heavily trafficked street as opposed to the moderate or the light traffic street, which clearly has a lot more interconnection. So what these charts are showing is that people on the light traffic street know more people, have more friends than on the heavily traffic street. On the light traffic street, people have on average three friends per person. And on the heavily traffic street, 0 0.9 friends per person. The fact that the amount of traffic on the street on which you live can impact the number of friends you have in the world is of enormous significance. The other thing that Donald Appleyard plotted on these charts are these little dots that indicate where people gather. So it shows on the heavily trafficked street, there are a much smaller number of dots and there are only a handful of places where people would gather on their street. The fact that they were able to measure and quantify the reduction in number of friends, in number of acquaintances, so these connections, and it wasn't until I saw this video and thought about it, thought about my own neighborhood. So take a minute, think about your neighborhood. Think about where your interactions are, your home neighborhood or your school neighborhood, both. And what I found was, this is a map of my little town of Pine Grove Mills. My house is the red mark right there. Um, and so what I discovered, there's a major route that is really hard to see on this map, but there's a major route that goes right across here, Route 45 goes right here, and then Route 26 goes right here. So two major highways, 
And what I reflected on is that this is where my friend group is, right? Nampuka is a really funny little made up community that the kids have made in my neighborhood and one of my neighbors put it on the map. So, uh, so this is Google Maps and you can see like the, all of my friends are kind of in this block and in that block, I hang out with, there are 22 Pine Grove Mills women that are on our, our chat list and you know, we get together and hang out. But it's interesting that only one of them lives over on this side of the street. Um, so it's interesting how cars and traffic and those roads and that space that's taking up is shaping our communities like that. So what happens in other places, right? If any of you have been to European cities, um, the European template as cities as places to live, right? They have these big courtyards where there aren't streets. There are the walkways with markets. So an example of this is Allen Street here in State College. There's a long time proposal to close the block of Allen Street from where the corner room is up to Panera. So just close that one block of street and make it a place you know, like this, an open courtyard. So there are people along that street, of course, there's the corner room, there's Appalachian Outdoors, Rapid Transit, Pickles, the Kalanahan's Food Market are all in that one block. And so the idea is that people would experience more community if that was, you know, not a trafficked street. So what do you think? Take a moment and debate this. I'm sure all of you have been in that space. Think about what, uh, what that would mean. Would you like it or not? love to hear your thoughts on this. What do you think? How would you feel about moving about that space? Um, why would I close it down if the distance is not that far on foot? I just feel like it's a waste of time or resources to use it as a space for cars because then you're just wasting gas from like point A to point B from like a, what, a two minute drive, a three minute drive, where it isn't just to walk on foot or uh, use a bike to get around, mm -hmm. plus you're exercising as well. So I don't see the purpose of closing it down and turn into a roadway for cars. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other opinions about that space? Sometimes they close down that space for festivals or for music that happens there on Allen Street. Yeah. Okay, so in like the like city part of my hometown, they like did that with one of the major streets uh -huh. in the city. Um, and like all the restaurants on that street were able to like take their tables outside. So I think it's like A, good for community, but also like better for business. So I feel like doing that here in State College would be a good idea. Like they already shut it down multiple times a year anyways, so right. I don't really, like obviously there's other streets you can go around, I think would be like a good thing for the community. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing. That's cool to hear about your town. Yeah. I just think that because it's such a popular area, there's already so many people there anyway. 
I'm actually curious, like, if anyone's ever gotten, like, hurt by a car in there, because it's always, like, there's champs there, there's always long lines. But I just yeah. think it would be nice and, like, more more of a gathering spot than it already is now if they put, like, a foul in just something, like, peaceful for yeah. people to kind of enjoy the space, like the picture. Yeah, it's curious. I'm not sure why the people are voting against it that are voting. It would be interesting to know that side, too. Did you? Yeah. I don't think it's really a good idea. Um, I experienced firsthand state college traffic on a Friday afternoon. A few weeks ago, I was going home, and that was that was pretty bad. Um, and I think blocking that road would only like increase the traffic along College Avenue, which is already a very congested space. And mm -hmm. by that logic, you're wasting more fuel because you can't take the shortcut through the road. And in terms, you're just increasing like your CO2 emissions by like having to go like only by congesting it and limit it to only one route. Uh huh. Okay. There's a flip side. Interesting. Yes. Thank you. The town next to me is pretty busy like all the time. And over COVID, they shut down about two streets downtown just so that like restaurants could eat outside and stuff. And People from all over were coming so that they could go to the restaurants, and everyone loved it, and so they made it a permanent thing. So I don't mm. think it would hurt. Yeah, I wonder what it would be like to do a trial and see about Friday afternoons. I totally hear you. Um, yeah, it would be an interesting trial. Thank you for that thought. Yeah. So places are playing with this, and communities are impacted by these kinds of choices. Um, and so as you move forward, you're going to live in a town, very likely, someplace. And, you know, how will you think about that community space? Or how will you be involved in the choices that are being made in your community? Um, thinking about um, the traffic, so lowering our transportation footprint and what's possible. Some of you have already gotten at this, like the walking or the biking. Um, so there's, there's this idea that, or this statistic, uh, that less, or excuse me, more than 35% of vehicle trips in the United States are less than two miles. More than 35% of our trips are less than two miles. So driving from place to place. I know that this is true in my hometown where my mom and dad, who are now older, it is much easier for them to drive to their workplace than it is to walk. It's a significant hill, even though it's just a few blocks away. And so I know that my mom has to get her muffler replaced pretty regularly because she's not driving long enough to heat up the engine to dry out that air that's in her muffler and so it rusts faster. So these, how many times do we hop in the car for just a one mile or a two mile trip, right? Is it really faster to drive sometimes than to walk? So doing this full cost counting, 20% of car trips are less than one mile. So when we take in the full cost accounting of what it means to have our car, thinking about the average person devotes 1,600 hours a year to their car. And so what does this matter? What, what does this really mean? 1,600 hours, the, the hours that you're driving, but then the hours that you're stopped at stoplights, you're idling your car, the hours that you're working at your job so that you can pay for your car, the hours that you spend in repair shops, you know, getting your car inspected or other repairs done. And then that doesn't even include time that you might need to go to court for that speeding ticket or that you might be in the hospital or, or at the doctor because of an accident. Um, the idea of cleaning your car, researching other new cars. Um, so those are, you know, so when we take all of that into account, we're really only going about 10 miles an hour. So how dedicated are you to your car, really? Um, and how will you choose where you live? Will you choose to live in a place where you have to have a car to get to go places, to the store and such, to work? Um, or will you choose to live in a place that you don't need to have a car and worry about those hours and those expenses? 
of having that car. So our car use has increased dramatically over the course of the last 50 years. It has to do with that idea of, of the suburbia and building up, but then also just how, um, how we choose to use them. Right? So you can do this. You can do yourself a transportation time audit. So how much time does it take to go in for you to drive someplace? The idea of finding your keys, of maintaining your car, of getting in and getting out and then parking. I hate parking downtown. It just seems like it takes forever to find a spot and get into it and then pay the meter and stop lights. So really what other options are there? And Ish just mentioned this, the idea of um, either, he didn't mention the public transportation, but we do have some public transportation in this area and other places have it even more so than we do. Um, Public transportation comes with its own pros and cons, and I don't expect you to be able to read this slot. But the idea of that there are so many pros and so many cons that trying to figure it out, for me, there used to be a bus that ran from Pine Grove Mills to State College. I could come to campus on the bus. Um, if I was willing to leave, or if I could leave at 8.30 in the morning or 7.30 in the morning, neither of which worked for me because I have to get my kids to school, and then I could only come back at two times in the afternoon, and those didn't work because I have to get my kids from school. So it's a matter of how does public transportation work? You know, it can, it can work in really great ways in some places more than others, but researching the possibilities. My brother and his family live in a town where they can hop on the train and go to Pittsburgh, and then they take public transportation all over the town, city of Pittsburgh, and it makes for a great family weekend out without having to drive there, which I think is pretty awesome um, for lots of reasons. I just, I like my car. I am um, thankful for my car, but driving is not one of my favorite things to do. So pros and cons of public transportation. But then there's this idea, this is what Ish mentioned about biking, right? About biking, getting exercise. The average fuel economy for model 2021 new cars, um, the average fuel economy for cars, light trucks, and SUVs was 25.7 miles per gallon. And that's come up significantly in the last couple of years. So I also know that there's a lot of research being done and I'm wondering why there isn't more improvement in this area, the miles per gallon. Cycling is said to be more efficient even than walking because we can get a farther distance on the energy that we're burning, right? So a typical car with one passenger uses 50 to 80 times more energy to travel the same distance as a person on a bicycle. So a 50-fold reduction in your ecological footprint. Bikes get essentially 930 miles per gallon. The way that that's calculated is the idea that if we put 100 calories of food into our body, 100 calories of food for a cyclist can take you about three miles. Um, 100 calories into a car, 100 calories of energy, would take that car about 280 feet. So thinking about how much more efficient, um, how much more efficient this way of transportation is. So there's this really quick video. I think it's an embedded video if you'll, yeah. I just love the whole atmosphere. <laughs>
the idea, obviously that was filmed someplace in Europe, the idea of celebrating cycling, um, the difference between you know, USA streets and European streets, the idea that biking, these are cycling lanes in Europe, um, and thinking even about, they call this a bike-friendly campus, but have any of you tried to bike around campus, especially when, when classes are changing? How many of you tried to bike around here? Yeah, me too. What's your experience been? Anybody wanna say anything about their experience biking? Um, one of my friends got hit by a biker on campus. Actually, yeah. a couple of them, not just one. Right. It's happened multiple times. Yeah. Not me personally, thank God. But Okay. Look both ways, Emma. Yes, yeah. I will. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm one of those people that bike around campus, and so does my family. Actually, my dad bikes to his office here every day. Like, biking's a big uh -huh. part of it yeah. for us. And it's just really not safe in many ways because cars and pedestrians don't seem to have an awareness of bikers coming. And even if they do, they're like, oh, well, I'm in the big car, it doesn't matter. And it's just, you never really feel safe. And you're also always on edge because there's, you know, students walking out everywhere. And it's yeah. just not like an actually like bike friendly campus. And there's not even bike lanes or anything either. Right. So you're getting pushed off the sidewalks and pushed off the streets like there's really no place. Yes, thank you for the biker perspective. Another one, yeah. So I bike around a lot, I drive around a lot, and scooter around a lot. Yeah. So I, I get to see all kinds of different aspects of this. And I've noticed that when I'm riding my bike, I feel as if cars want to hit me. Oh, interesting, so, yeah, I and, have had that, I and agree. Uh, the last, the first person, she brought up how her friend got hit. Um, last week before class, my friend also got hit. Yeah. And that was partially our fault, but, but still, like, he got hit and the car <coughs> drove away really quick. So it was a hit and run. So I feel as if cars should do a better job of not hitting people. And we'll do our part as cyclists and bike better, but... Yeah. It has to go both ways. It does. And so it's challenging. Thank you for all of that. Um, oh, uh, here's another one up here. Oh, and there's another one back there. This is great. Okay. Just a minute. We'll get there. So earlier this semester, I got hit by a bike. And it was just not a good experience. I mean, it was like a hit and run. Um, I was literally just walking on the pavement and this girl just kind of rear ends me from the back and then like I, gu I guess she apologized and then she just kept on going. Um, yeah, I'm not a really big fan of people that ride bikes, especially if they're on the sidewalk too. Because um, it's just like, you just kind of get in the way with people. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of bikes. Oh, the tension. Right. Thank you. Go ahead up there. Um, my roommate was also hit by a bike from behind, and she broke her arm, oh. and they just, no one like helped her, they just left her there, and the person drove away, so bikes probably aren't the best on the sidewalk. It's, it's the clash, right? Yeah. Go ahead. I actually, um, on our way back from our field trip, um, <laughs> we actually saw a guy, like, literally run into a car on his bike. And then that was a real experience. Um, yeah, and I also fell off my bike going like 50 miles an hour because there were ignorant people who couldn't look like up and it was just was not fun. And I like right. fell so hard that like ruined my clothes because it burnt through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah. it. So all kinds of experiences. One more over here and then. Oh, and one, go ahead up there while we're getting the mic. Um, okay, so I knew like nothing about the biking world before my client for my consulting group, but somehow I got partnered with like the bike den here. Um, and so 
like she's talked about how unsafe the biking industry actually like is at Penn State, and I know also people have mentioned like they've gotten hit by a bike. I've gotten hit by like multiple bikes somehow, but I don't think it's really safe. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so as someone who likes to spin bike a lot, um, I do like the breeze that like you get, like kind of like a like a thrill you get sometimes. Yeah. But on the contrary, like when I'm walking to class or somewhere where I have to go. Um, I don't go on the sidewalk, and I'd appreciate it if everyone at Penn State would not ride their bike or scooter on the sidewalk because it kind of puts you in a weird spot. Um, also, like when you're crossing the street, you have to kind of like make eye contact with the person and tell like if you're going in front of them or behind them. So yeah. it's kind of awkward in that way. But I would say this campus isn't horrible for biking. Uh, I think there's a lot of walkways and stuff, but uh, yeah, I definitely like to spin bike a lot. Yeah, good. Thank you. So all kinds of perspectives and all kinds of tension, right, from the drivers. I know that driving is stressful. I know that biking is stressful. I know that the walking when bikes are coming around. And so, you know, there could be some way to make some action to make this a more bike-friendly campus. Um, so while I don't want to be part of the problem, right, of just bringing We still have time. Do not pack up of bringing up all the issues and not being able to solve them. It's interesting that the environmental impact of planes takes center stage. They are, it are quite wasteful, as, or they, they put out a lot of emissions. So many passengers actually are becoming more reluctant. They're more aware of this, more reluctant to fly. In Sweden, it's known as flying shame. Frequent flyers are getting called out for their activities, and a record number of people are choosing to travel by train instead of airplane. The last time I flew, I had this option. I thought this was interesting. You can offset your carbon by joining the, they do this through Southwest, Delta, British Airways, United. And so people are becoming aware of what's going on. I want to say that it's amazing that those of you, you know, talking about riding your bikes, it helps your health, it helps the environment, and it helps your wallet if it's done in the right way, in a safe way, right? So we're going to talk more about this green triangle and these connections, how bringing together the crisis, the danger and opportunity, the choices that we have, and the courage that we can bring about to make this change. So I'm going to give you your pack back question on Wednesday this week, but there is a new pack back prompt, or excuse me, a new uh, blog prompt up um, about permission. If you're curious about it, go check it out there. I want to point out that opportunity, it depends how you look at it. Opportunity is nowhere or opportunity is now here. I hope that you have a beautiful day.